this theme on Christian apologetics. I hope uh, by the, at least by the end of the week, everyone here can define Christian apologetics. If I've done that, I've accomplished something. Uh, giving a reason, defense of the Christian faith for God's existence, the inspiration of the Bible, the deity of Christ, Christian evidences. And uh, I want to warn you up front, we're going to talk about macroevolution this morning, and this is big boy and big girl stuff. And it's probably as intellectually challenging and stimulating as any of the material and content. Everything we're doing this week is somewhat of an academic nature, but maybe as challenging and stimulating as anything I'm going to cover this week. But evidently, the uh, leadership here, the congregation here thinks you can handle it. I think you can handle it. And I want to commend you. Uh, yesterday, it's amazing what you can see when you're up here. And what I saw was a lot of uh, young people, young men and women who had engaged their mind, who were paying attention, who were seeking to love God with all of their heart, all of their soul, and all of their mind. And I want to beg you to do that again this morning. And it's, you're going to have to lock in. <laughs> we're covering a lot of ground this week. We're trying to give a comprehensive uh, coverage of the main arguments and areas of Christian evidences. And to do that, we're covering a lot of ground. Uh, I've been given 50 minutes to an hour roughly. That's about the, the length of a college lecture and a college classroom that you're going to experience. And so I'm begging you, lock in, uh, engage your mind, and let's choose to love God with all of our minds this morning as we study the subject of macroevolution. We want to begin by talking about macroevolution versus the laws of science because there's a great conflict I want to show you this morning. And I want to begin by convincing you again of why this matters. Start with why. I emphasized that yesterday. you got to start with why. Why apologetics? Why do we need to study the theory of macroevolution? The question of origins is critical in shapes and effects our past, our present, and our future. Who you are, where you came from, where you're going. William Provine, we referenced this quote from a Darwin Day speech where he talked about the implications. If Darwinism, uh, macroevolution, atheism is true. Here are some of the fundamental implications. Number one, there's no evidence for God. Two, there's no life after death. Three, there's no absolute foundation for morality. We talked about that yesterday. There's no ultimate meaning for life. That was our conclusion we talked about. People don't have free will. And so there's only two options. If you eliminate the third option of alien seeding life on earth, in fact, you think I'm joking, evolutionists have proposed, because the theory of evolution has so many problems, some have theorized that aliens must have planted life on earth. That still doesn't explain where the alien life come from. Still hasn't addressed that question. So if you eliminate the third option, that aliens seeded life on earth and we're now waiting for the mothership, there's two options. Special creation or macroevolution. That's the only explanations for human origins. So I want to differentiate between macroevolution and microevolution. I've intentionally entitled the study macroevolution versus laws of science because there's a difference. And evolutionists are very crafty and cunning in blurring that distinction and defining evolution so broadly that anything counts as proof that evolution occurs. And so I'm going to try to talk a lot about macroevolution. If you hear me say evolution in a negative way, I'm talking about macroevolution, not microevolution. That's usually what we're talking about. But think about micro versus macro. Micro is smaller. Macro is larger. Think about macroeconomics. Microeconomics or microevolution is adaptation, slight changes, variations, diversification within kinds. But you don't change from one kind to another. What you learn in school, adaptation. And certainly, microevolution is not incompatible with the Bible, nor with the evidence, nor with the data. So microevolution does occur. That type of evolution does occur. What doesn't occur, what isn't compatible with the Bible and the Genesis account of creation and the evidence is macroevolution. And that's changing from one kind to another. A dog becoming a pig and a pig becoming a cow. Uh, that has never been, a, that does not occur. That's not in line with what the Bible teaches and with the evidence that we see. But evolutionists will blur the distinction in science textbooks and you'll see examples put forth that show here, this proves evolution occurs. The, the uh, adaptation of this beak or this change here. See, this is proof that evolution occurs. And they won't tell you if they're talking about micro or macro evolution. And so kids will think, well, 
I've, I've been given all this evidence, this proof that evolution does occur. We see that in nature. The question is, what kind of evolution? Micro, slight changes, diversification, variation, adaptation, or macro, changing from one kind to another. And so be very aware of that and diligent in making that distinction. Again, why this matters, if you look at statistics and research that bears out the fact that how religious a Christian is, a person is, is tied to whether or not they believe in macroevolution or special creation. I mean, that's just a fact. And what the research also bears out is that those who try to harmonize the theory of microevolution with the Genesis account of creation, that theistic evolution, believing in God and macroevolution, is a gateway to atheism is a gateway to skepticism and doubt and ultimately unbelief. And so that's why, again, this matters. Is Genesis literal? Is it historical? Or is it mythical? The style, obviously, as you read it, is literal. It's dealing with historical events. Jesus quoted from the book of Genesis on multiple occasions. So not only is the book of Genesis and its credibility in question, so is the credibility of Christ. The inspired New Testament writers made doctrinal arguments based on events that were recorded in the book of Genesis, such as the flood. All but three New Testament books quote from or refer to the book of Genesis. So again, if we can't trust the first book, the first chapter, the first verse in the Bible, how do we trust anything that follows? If you can't trust what the Bible says about creation, how can you trust what the Bible says about salvation? So what about theistic macroevolution? Can we believe in God in the Bible and also believe in the theory of evolution? That's theistic macroevolution. There are many problems with this. One, did man rise or fall? Macroevolution puts death before sin, before man even arrives on the scene. Death is a reality. Therefore, death isn't a consequence of sin. And if that's the case, Jesus' death can't pay for sins. We've just destroyed the gospel. If evolution is true, there was no first man, there was no fall, and if there's no fall, there's no need for a savior. And that's a huge implication. Evolution teaches that the sexes evolved. The Bible teaches that God created them male and female from the very beginning, that humans existed from the beginning. Jesus himself said that. But if evolution is true and the universe is 14 billion years old and man arrived on the scene a million or two million years ago, on a 24-hour clock, that would be like man arriving two seconds before midnight. That's an awfully long way away from the beginning. There are other issues with trying to harmonize uh, these two things. Some will say the days represent eons of time, uh, millions and millions of years uh, in time, and that time is nothing to God. So those days don't have to be literal. Maybe they're figurative. Well, the talks about evening and morning, or, and it makes it pretty clear that it's referring to a 24-hour period. The word in the Hebrew, yom, it means a 24-hour period. There's no contextual indicators to tell us that it's speaking figuratively. Why is God trying to trick us? And there are many issues and implications if we try to say that those days represent millions of years. Let me give you just a few examples. Plants were created the day before sun. the sun. How did plants survive millions of years without sunlight? Birds were created before insects. How did birds survive millions of years without insects? Man, we are told, was created with dominion over all of God's creation. How could man have exercised dominion over all of God's creation if much of that creation, dinosaurs, etc., went extinct before man even existed? It says that God finished creation after the sixth day. Evolution teaches that creation of new kinds is ongoing. So naturalism is an attempt to explain uh, what we see uh, naturally uh, without allowing for the supernatural. Many people, evolutionists and atheists will consider themselves naturalists. They just believe in what you can see and observe in nature. An attempt to explain the universe by nature alone without any uh, supernatural explanation is presented as fact. That's the problem is we're brainwashed. We're inundated with this as if it's a fact. It's not a theory. It's a fact. Uh, it's a law. We talk about the quote from uh, outspoken atheist and evolutionist Richard Dawkins who said, if you don't believe the theory of evolution, you're stupid, insane, wicked, ignorant. The ironic thing is there's no such thing as a naturalist. I mean, a, a real consistent naturalist because a naturalist has to believe in things that defy nature and the laws of nature to believe in the theory of evolution, to believe that things have occurred in violation of the laws of science, the laws of nature for evolution to occur. 
So they believe in unnatural things. That's the irony. Macroevolution is based on unnatural events. Spontaneous generation, life coming from nothing, popping into existence. Abiogenesis, life not coming from life of its own kind. Those are unnatural things that have never been observed in nature, but yet that's what macroevolutionists have to believe to believe in the theory of macroevolution. So again, we talked about yesterday how we need to be careful that we don't redefine words like faith. They'll define faith in a way, and if we accept those definitions, we're backed into a corner in an indefensible position. And they do that with a lot of words and concepts. They'll redefine it, including science, where they try to frame it science versus the Bible. And they'll try to define science in a way that the non-natural is excluded. And if the non-natural is excluded, then God is excluded. And God is deemed unscientific because he's non-natural. He's non-material. He's a spirit. But again, we see these quotes. It's not about the evidence. It's not about the data. It's about the inferences, the interpretations that are made on the data. And that's affected by our worldview. That's how we see in, in, in the inferences we make from the evidence. Our willingness to accept scientific claims against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science, framing it science versus the Bible, belief in God, which isn't true, but notice in spite, in spite, in spite. Why? Because we're committed to naturalism. We don't want to see or believe in anything beyond naturalism. That's the bias. That's the agenda. We are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes, no matter how counterintuitive. And here's the kicker, that materialism is absolute for because we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. That's the problem. The question, though, is, is naturalism a reasonable, rational assumption? And we're going to show this morning it's not. Macroevolution is based on things that have never been observed. A quote here, talking about cause and effect, we're going to talk about more in a moment, how cause and effect is a fundamental law of science. You have to have an adequate cause for all effects. That's a fundamental law. And yet he says, we see that, no exception, but it just fails at the beginning. We just get to a point where we don't have a cause anymore. It just fails at the beginning. Why? Why does it fail at the beginning? Because we cannot allow a divine foot in the door, an uncaused first cause. And that is really a blow at the very fundamental premise that motivates all scientists. I mentioned yesterday the law of rationality, a fundamental law of philosophy which says draw only such conclusions that are warranted by the evidence. And so if we aren't following that law, we are acting irrationally. Our faith in a model should not be blind. We talked about that yesterday. Not subjective, not based on feelings and biases and agendas. And the facts, the reality, simply do not support the theory of macroevolution. I want to show you that. And I want to show you things they don't want you to know about <laughs> this morning. What is a scientific law? McGraw-Hill, you maybe have many textbooks in school, McGraw-Hill. A regularity which applies to all members of a broad class of phenomena. Notice the word all, not some, not most, all. All, without exception. That's why it's a scientific law. It's never been violated. There are no exceptions to natural laws. Never been observed in nature. That's why it's a law. Scientific laws have no exceptions. Stephen Hawking, famous atheistic macroevolutionist physicist on a show on the Discovery Channel, said this universe is a machine governed by principles or laws, laws that can be understood by the human mind. I believe that the discovery of these laws has been humankind's greatest achievement. But what's really important is that these physical laws, as well as being unchangeable, are universal. They apply not just to the flight of the ball, but to the motion of a planet and everything else in the universe. Unlike laws made by humans, the laws of nature cannot ever be broken. That's why they are so powerful. And the question is, where did these laws come from? It's not just about the, the question of origins. Where did life come from? It's really a question about where did the information come from? Where the law? You don't get laws without a law writer. You don't get code without a code writer. Where did the laws come from? Humanist Martin Gardner. That, why is there something rather than nothing? And why is the something structured or governed the way that it is? Where did these laws come from? You know, it's interesting in this dialogue with Job we referenced yesterday and, and God's giving an answer for himself. And one of the things he said, do you know how this works? Were you there when I made this? Do you understand how all these things work? We're still trying to understand. You, you don't, you're not omniscient. You don't see what I see. You don't know what I know. And one of the things he says is, do you know the ordinances or the laws of the heavens? 
Do you understand the laws of science that I instituted, that I created? And then he gives him a science lesson in geology, cosmology, astronomy, physics, oceanography, optics, meteorology, physics, biology, subdisciplines in biology, zoology, orology, entomology, herpetology, botany, marine biology, etc. He impresses upon Job the greatness of God by referring him to the greatness of the things God's created. You want to know the best example of macroevolution? <laughs> the theory of evolution. It's always changing. Always needing more time. You know, in Darwin's day, he thought 20 million years because it's based on impossible, improbable events. Well, if we just have enough time, these impossible things can become possible. We just need enough time. He thought 20 million years was enough, enough time for his theory. Today, they are estimating the universe to be 14 billion years. And they say it doubles every 20 or 30 years or so. So maybe in a few decades, it'll be 28 billion years because it's so we continue to find more and more evidence that says this cannot happen by accident, by chance. So I refer you to the definition of insanity. Maybe it's time we scrap this theory. So how does macroevolution violate laws of science? Let me give you a few examples this morning. The laws of thermodynamics. Therma meaning heat, dunamis force. It's the science of energy, heat, work, potential energy, internal energy, kinetic energy. Engineers use these principles, these laws in their designs to control the impact of heat and other forms of energy on their designs. The first law of thermodynamics states energy can be neither created nor destroyed, but can only be converted from one form to another. That's never been disproven. There are no exceptions to the first law of thermodynamics. The second, uh, the Bible says that God finished his work. We referenced those uh, verses earlier. The second law says that creation is presently in a state of decay. Everything is running down. Energy is running out. That's what we call entropy. Uh, energy is irrecoverably lost to man and therefore wasted, although not annihilated. So it can't be added or destroyed. It changes forms and it's wasting away. It's becoming less usable over time. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Examples of entropy... Uh, vehicles, your house, your own body, uh, your bedroom likely is an example of entropy. It's going from more order to less order, uh, from structure to more chaos. That's entropy and there's no exception. Albert Einstein called this law the premier law of science. So if your theory contradicts the laws of thermodynamics, it's wrong, period. The Bible says and describes entropy, uh, the, like the, the universe and the earth waxing old, the bondage of corruption, it's passing away. And so, is it possible that our universe created itself, that it was spontaneously generated? If we're trying to look for explanations outside of an uncaused first cause, outside of God, well, a convenient explanation would be that it, the universe just created itself, <laughs> popped into existence. But without God, without something outside of nature, a spirit outside of nature, the universe is a closed system, not an open system. It's a closed system. And according to the laws of thermodynamics in a closed system, this matter, this energy cannot be created or destroyed. It remains the same. So if the universe initially contained no mass, no matter, no energy, and all of that just spontaneously generated itself, popped into existence, the first law of thermodynamics is violated. It violates this law of science. It's not possible. There are no exceptions to a scientific law. So without intervention, mass, matter, energy would have remained unchanged. And if it started at nothing and it remained unchanged, what would that result in? Nothing. That means no thing. Uh, and I'm trying to insult anybody's intelligence. It's, it's a sad state that we have to make such observations. The initial creation of matter, mass, energy from nothing is a miracle. Atheists and evolutionists will admit that in their writings. Uh, it seems that order has arisen out of chaos. That's the opposite of the second law of thermodynamics. In apparent defiance of the second law of thermodynamics, does this then suggest that some sort of gigantic, cosmic, not uh, theistic, of course, cosmic miracle has occurred against all imaginable betting odds and probabilities we're going to talk about here in a moment. Conservation of energy or the laws of thermodynamics and other basic laws hold true in the most distant observed galaxies. And he goes on to say, but it's been violated like a miracle. 13.7 billion years ago with the Big Bang, it was violated like a miracle, but not a miracle from God. The universe could not have come into existence without the intervention of an outside force that was non-material, non-natural spirit, the uncaused first cause. 
What about uh, the quotes here? I must admit that there are yet no empirical or observational tests that can be used to test the idea of an accidental origin. Of course, this is Richard Dawkins. It's counterintuitive that you can get something from nothing. Of course, common sense doesn't allow you to get something from nothing, but we're going to believe it anyway, (laughs) no matter how counterintuitive it is. It's difficult to accept a theory that violates such a firmly established scientific fact, speaking of the laws of thermodynamics. So if the universe didn't create itself, and we're looking for an explanation besides God, then it's convenient to just say the universe has always existed. That avoids a beginning. That avoids a cause. That that avoids creation. Is the universe eternal? Well, the overwhelming evidence has caused virtually everyone, including atheists and evolutionists, to reject this model. It also violates laws of thermodynamics. If the universe is eternal, if there is a finite amount of energy, then it should all be used up according to the second law of thermodynamics. If the universe is eternal, but we have a limited amount of energy, then it should all be used up by now. The lingering decline predicted by astronomers for the end of the world differs from the explosive conditions they have calculated for its birth, but the impact is the same. Modern science denies an eternal existence of the universe, either in the past or the future. He goes on to say, and concurrently there was a great deal of discussion about the fact that the second law of thermodynamics applied to the cosmos indicates the universe is running down like a clock. If it's running down, there must have been a time when it was fully wound up. That proves the beginning. Now three lines of evidence, the motions of the galaxies, the laws of thermodynamics, the life story of the stars, pointed to one conclusion, all indicate that the universe had a beginning. And that matter demands a maker. There are only three possible explanations then. The first two have been disproven. That leaves one explanation. Special creation. man here talked about, he was an atheist. When he began to he would never have believed he would be defending faith in, the, in, in God. But his field of, and branch of physics led him to that belief. Lord Kelvin uh, said, science positively affirms creative power. If you think strongly enough, you'll be forced by science to the belief in God, which is the foundation of all religion. You will find science not antagonistic, but helpful to religion. What about the law of causality? How does, we've been referring to cause and effect, how does macroevolution violate law, the law of causality, which states every material effect must have an adequate antecedent or simultaneous cause. Effects have causes. That's all that's talking about. And the, the cause precedes or is simultaneous, but it's never after the effect. You don't get an effect and then a cause. The cause precedes the effect. Every student of logic knows that this is the ultimate canon of the sciences, the foundation of them all. If we do not believe the truth of causation, namely everything which has a beginning has a cause, and that in the same circumstances, the same things invariably happen, all the sciences would at once crumble to dust. In every scientific investigation, this truth is assumed. True knowledge is knowledge by causes. And so to deny the law of causality is to deny rationality. It's irrational. If someone says they don't believe in the law of causation, ask them what caused them to believe that. Albert Einstein said, but the scientist is possessed by the sense of universal Causation. Without this law, science can't occur. Science is about causes and effects. It can't proceed. Progress in science comes from developing better explanations for the causes of natural phenomenon. The goal of scientific experiments, you've learned this in the, the scientific method and process, is to determine what happens, the effects, when certain things are done. The causes. Science assumes the relationship between cause and effect. You gather the evidence... You test hypotheses to find regularities. And there are no regularities. There are no laws without cause and effect. So the question is, what caused the effect? What caused the universe? Evolutionists and atheists have the impossible task of trying to explain the effect of an infinitely complex universe coming to existence without a cause. From nothing. As Einstein said, scientists live by their faith in causation, the chain of cause and effect. Every effect has a cause that can be discovered by rational arguments. And this has been a very successful program, if you will, for unraveling the history of the universe. But it just fails at the beginning. We get to a point where we don't want to go beyond that cause, to the ultimate cause, to the uncaused first cause. So time really going backward comes to a halt at that point. Beyond that, that curtain can never be lifted. And that is really a blow at the very fundamental premise that motivates all. Why? 
Why can't it be lifted? Because we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Hebrews 3 verse 4, though, we see the Bible teaches cause and effect. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Genesis 1 verse 1 tells us who the cause is. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the uncaused first cause. So often the question is, what caused God? That's a very good question. Kids will ask that question. Well, who caused, if we have to have a cause for everything, then what about when you get to God? Who caused God? The question reflects how seriously we take the law of causality and cause and effect. But I want to refer you back to the laws of thermodynamics. Every material effect must have a cause. And the answer is God is not a material effect. God is a spirit. He is non-material. And so he is not subject to the laws of thermodynamics. He's eternal. He doesn't have a beginning. He's always been. Manuel Kant writes, everything which is contingent has a cause, which if itself contingent must also have a cause, and so on, to the series of subordinated causes must end with an absolutely necessary cause, God, without which it would not possess completeness. God's not contingent. Therefore, he does not require a cause. God is the uncaused first cause. So there's two options. Either the universe was created and had a beginning or it's eternal created, or it created itself. The universe is not eternal. Therefore, it must have been created by something outside of itself. It can't be self-caused or else it would have already had to exist to cause something. And so the question is, if there's no God, why is there something rather than nothing? Either no one created something out of nothing or someone created something out of nothing. You tell me what's more reasonable. What's more rational? What's more scientific? How does macroevolution violate the laws of probability? See the quotes here. Probability is a cornerstone of all the sciences, and its daughter, the science of statistics, enters into all human activities. Science can't always tell you exact what happened and what will happen, but it gives probabilities, likelihoods that something happened or will happen. So we have a high degree of confidence. The single law of chance and probability states events whose probability is extremely small never occur. And Maile Burrell, a renowned French mathematician, talks about this when he says, The sort of event which, though its impossibility may not be rationally demonstrable, is, however, so unlikely that no sensible person will hesitate to declare it actually impossible. If someone affirmed having observed such an event, we would be sure that he is deceiving us or has himself been the victim of fraud. And that's what I would say about macroevolution in regard to these probabilities. They've either been deceived or they're trying to deceive us. He argues that the probability of a certain event happening in the universe is less than 1 in 10 to the 45th power. (laughs) That's very improbable. Humans intuitively categorize that event as so unlikely that we consider it to be an impossible event. Rightly so. Several years ago, a man at Yale estimated the probability of the formation of the smallest and simplest living organism to be 1 in 10 to the 340 millionth power. That's a lot of zeros beyond 10 to the 45th power in the single law of chance. Carl Sagan made his own estimate a few years later of the chance that life could evolve on any given single planet as 1 in 10 to the 2 billionth power. Again, well beyond 10 to the 45th power. And since These quotes, we've discovered even more complexity, and so that number is growing. Macroevolution is a macro violation of the single law of chance. (laughs) The chance that higher forms have emerged in this way is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. Michael Behe uh, gave a probability of get, getting one protein molecule, which has about 100 amino acids, by chance would be the same as taking a blindfolded man, finding one grain of sand, marking that sand, that blindfolded man, the Sahara Desert, finding it three times in a row. It's pretty lucky. <laughs> you see how big the Sahara Desert is in Africa. A blindfolded man finding a marked grain of sand in that entire desert, not just once, not just twice, three times. Don't let macroevolutionists cover their ignorance with time and chance, with this mythical marriage between father, uh, time, and mother nature. Kamal Garov's first axiom, and don't get caught up in these names and these big words. Sometimes I think we hear people talk about the, the uh, Greek word in the Bible as we're studying, and, or we talk about the, uh, theological terms, big words, scientific terms we're studying this morning, and we we check out. Uh, you know, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. I don't want to learn anything. And we, we're intellectually lazy. You don't have to even know how to pronounce some of these words. That's not the point. Know the concept. 
engage your mind, challenge yourself enough to, to say, that's what you do at school. You learn definitions for words. You learn words that you didn't understand the grade before, the year before. You engage yourself and you learn new things. So don't check out because there's a big word or named after some Russian or whoever's name that we can't pronounce. It doesn't matter. Understand the concept. And it simply states, and it's not a complicated concept, events whose probabilities are zero are impossible events. Thank you, Captain Obvious. That's a pretty, uh, what he's saying is if the probability is zero, it's not going to happen. I mean, you don't have to know how to pronounce that to understand the concept. If zero probability exists, it will not matter how much time is allotted. That's the point. If we're talking about things that have to happen for evolution to be true, and if those things are zero, you can't just say, well, given enough time, you know, 14 billion years, if the probability is zero, it's not going to happen. That's a law of probability that's never been violated. Several events necessary for microevolution to occur spontaneous generation, abiogenesis, etc., have a probability of zero. Not 0 0.1, zero. Zero. How can you give a probability to something that has zero evidence? You can't wave a magic wand and say, well, given enough time, those things can happen. It's like saying, you know, given enough time, gravity doesn't exist and you'll begin to levitate. Macroevolution is not just improbable, it's impossible. Probability is zero, but yet we see him given enough time. <laughs> However improbable, given enough time. Time is the hero of the plot. Given so much time, now they get more confident. The impossible becomes possible. The possible becomes probable, and the probable becomes virtually certain. One is only to wait. Time itself performs miracles. Remember what Burrell said, though, events that fall into the single law of chance, that sensible humans must act in all circumstances as if they were impossible. Who's ignorant? The more statistically improbable a thing is, the less we can believe that it just happened by blind chance. Superficially, the obvious alternative to chance is an intelligent designer. Finally, the law of biogenesis, which states, in nature, life comes only from life and that of its own kind. Never been violated. Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man in the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Macroevolution cannot be harmonized with that verse. Did God breathe into the first single cell organism the breath of life or humans? the breath of life. You can't harmonize the two. In nature, life comes only from life, and I want to emphasize, and that of its own kind. Dogs don't give birth to cats. Horses don't give birth to cows. Again, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, and it's, again, it's tragic that we have to make such observations. Genesis 1, we see the law of biogenesis from the first chapter of the Bible. Plants and animals and humans produce after their own kind. That's the theme you see over and over, after its kind, after its kind, after its kind. Because God instituted the law of biogenesis. Again, we've referred to this uh, quote. I think a scientist has no choice but to approach the origin of life through a hypothesis. A spontane Why? Why must we do that? Because we've defined science in such a way that anything that's not natural, the supernatural, must be excluded. You know, scientists have tried and tried to conduct experiments to prove that life can spontaneously generate itself, and it's failed every time. You're probably most familiar with Pasteur's experiments that you maybe learned in science class, where they've tried to prove that life could somehow pop into existence, but that's not possible. That's why this law is a law of science. It's never been violated. Every person you've ever known, he said, this is a fundamental law, so fundamental that we take it for granted Every person you've ever known has biological parents, as does every bird, salamander, or shark. Life comes from life of its own kind, the law of biogenesis. You see here uh, admissions of the fact that there are biases and agendas and worldviews that inf influence the inferences that scientists draw based on the data. They, they're not as objective and dispassionate in the work as they would like you to think. They have reasons for maybe believing some of the things they do. To make an organism demands the right substances in the right proportions and the right arrangements. We do not think that anything more is needed, but that is a problem enough. One is only to contemplate the magnitude of this task and see that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. Yet here we are. <laughs> it's impossible, yet we're going to believe it because we don't want to believe in God. It's, it's by far the weakest strut of the theory of evolution. In fact, McGraw-Hill defines abiogenesis as the obsolete concept that plant and animal life arise from non-living organic matter. But if you don't believe in special creation, you have to believe in spontaneous generation. 
So I'm not going to read all these quotes, but what you'll see is when asked, how did life arise? How did it pop into existence? How do you explain human origins, the origin of life, the origin of information? What you'll see is, in summary, we don't have a clue. We don't know. Fantas- all is conjecture. There's no scientific evidence. What concrete evidence supports that remarkable theory of the origin of life? There is none. At present, we have no, science has no satisfactory answer, naturalistic science anyway, to the origin of life on the earth. In this lecture series, Origins of Life, this atheist and evolutionist admits there's so much that we don't know about life on earth. We don't know how life began. Most of the puzzle pieces are missing. How can I tell you about the origin of life when we are so woefully ignorant of that history? And then they go back to just saying, well, it's a cosmic miracle. We have no clue. It's just a miracle. An honest man armed with all the knowledge available to us now could only state that in some sense the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have had to have been satisfied to get it going. We talked about that, the fine-tuning argument yesterday. And so you see here a quote where they talk about spontaneous generation and how in present conditions never been observed violate a law of science. We have no evidence that spontaneous generation has occurred or can occur, but maybe it arose under different conditions in the past. You know what that means? You know when he says different conditions, you know what he's saying? Evidenceless speculation. I'll translate that for you. Evidenceless speculation. Who's the scientist? Who's following the law of rationality? And I love this uh, quote here. As for spontaneous generation, it continued to find acceptance until finally disposed of by the work of Louis Pasteur, it is a curious thing that until quite recently, professors of biology habitually told this story as part of their introductions of students to biology. They would finish this account glowing with the conviction that they had given a telling demonstration of the overthrow of mystical notion by clean scientific experimentation. Their students were usually so bemused as to forget to ask the professor how he accounted for the origin of life. This would have been an embarrassing question because there are only two possibilities. Either life arose by spontaneous generation, which the professor had just refuted, or it arose by supernatural creation, which he probably regarded as anti-scientific. So here's some quotes from a 1990s biology, high school biology textbook. And notice here, after talking about how spontaneous generation had been disproven by many experiments, such as the one Pasteur performed, But then it begins to speculate with certainty what conditions were like on earth billions of years ago. And answering the question, the question was asked, if spontaneous generation has been disproven, how did life arise? And notice all the disclaimer. No one can say with certainty, somehow, some could have, certainly not life. Textbook goes on to discuss experiments of Russian and American scientists created a round droplet steam prototype they created in their lab, which can perform ne- tasks necessary for life. So they're trying to make kind of a subtle argument here that life could come in. However, they admit that we would still not say that these droplets are alive. <laughs> so the original point was to explain how life could have spontaneously risen in the past. How do you explain life after, when spontaneous generation has been disproven? After several paragraphs of speculation and explanation, they still haven't answered the question. Sadly, many students believe that the answer must be coming up somewhere in the book. May have not caught all the disclaimers saying, we don't have a clue what we're talking about. And they just take the writers, the evolutionist word for it. Don't do that. And don't let your children do that. Which explanation is rational and scientific? If one rejects supernatural creation and rejects the law of biology, you have to believe that the universe popped into existence. You have to believe in spontaneous generation. Who's the scientist? Who's being unscientific? Who's applying the law of rationality? Who has the blind, evidenceless faith? Aliens initiated life on earth? Abiogenesis, like magic, produces life from non-life? The universe just popped magically into existence? Non-humans produce humans? Life doesn't come from non-life. Laws of science don't write themselves. Matter and energy don't spontaneously generate themselves, nor do they last forever. Order doesn't come from disorder. Complexity doesn't come from simplicity in violation of the laws of thermodynamics. Macroevolution is witchcraft without a witch. Against all scientific laws, empirical and forensic evidence, 
Darwinist claim spontaneous generation or alien seeding that magically explains the first life. It's not science, it's comedy. Let's stand at this time and have a song. After this song, we're going to talk about how macroevolution and genetics and macroevolution versus the fossil record. You know, in, in Darwin's day, they had no way of seeing the complexity that exists within the membrane of a cell. Now, all the things about genetics and DNA hadn't been discovered yet. And so he thought that a, evolution starting with a single cell it was a pretty simple thing, a pretty simple uh, organism. And yet, I mentioned yesterday, in one single cell, there's the equivalent of 600,000 pages of information, 10 to the 12th bits of information. There's nothing simple about any life, any aspect of life. See the quote here, one person described a single cell organism like a high-tech factory complete with artificial languages and decoding systems, central memory banks that store and retrieve impressive amounts of information, precision control systems that regulate the automatic assembly of components, proofreading and quality control mechanisms that safeguard against errors, assembly systems that use principles of prefabrication and modular construction and a complete replication system that allows the organism to duplicate itself at bewildering speeds. An Amazon warehouse has nothing on a single cell. It's able to do all that. Natural selection is a misnomer. There is no selection without intelligence. Where did the intelligence to select come from? Where did the mind to do that come from? In living systems, the guidance needed to assemble everything comes from DNA, which is like a microprocessor that regulates everything, and it works with RNA to direct the correct sequencing of amino acids. Where did the genetic code come from? Where did that information come from? You have to put a lot of amino acids together in just the right sequence to make a protein molecule, and then you need to bring together a collection of protein molecules to get to a living cell. So it's like you have to take letters and arrange them in the perfect order to get words, and then arrange the words in the perfect order to get sentences, to get paragraphs, pages, books, etc. It's like if I came home and we have these magnetic letters that can stick to the refrigerator or the dishwasher, and I saw Kyson, I would know there was an intelligence behind that. Maybe not Kinsley, but there was an intelligence behind that message. A message demands a messenger. Where'd the message come from? You can't get the right sequencing, that information, those words, sentences, books, without an intelligence. Natural selection is defined as a natural process that results in the survival and reproductive success of individuals or groups best adjusted to their environment, and that leads to the perpetuation of genetic qualities best suited to that particular environment, survival of the fittest. Only those that are best able to adapt in, in, to their environment survive. You either move somewhere else where you are adapted to survive or you die out. Charles Darwin's famous book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. The essence of Darwinism lies in a single phrase, natural selection is the creative force of evolutionary change. No one denies that selection will play a negative role in eliminating the unfit. Darwinian theories require that it create the fit as well. That's the problem. It can't create anything. It can't create new information. The question, how did life originate, which interests us all, is inseparably linked to the question, where did the information come from? All evolutionary views are fundamentally unable to answer this crucial question. There is no known law of physics able to create information from nothing. We talked about that earlier. It's not just a question, where did life, life come from? Where did the information for life come from? You can't spontaneously generate information or life. Talked about this earlier. Every living thing had parents. Then notice at the end, every living thing sprang from some parental genetic information. It's true. It's a law. Natural selection seeks to explain the survival of the fittest, but it can't explain the arrival of the fittest. And that's the problem. Enter neo-Darwinism. Neo means new or modified. Natural selection now plus mutations. The mutations are the mechanism for creating new information, for creating new things. And the natural selection... Eliminates the unfit, leaving the better, more evolved species into existence. But again, that doesn't solve the spontaneous generation of information problem. Where the information, the intelligence to do that come from? Sanford likens the human genome 
which is the entire set of DNA instructions found in a cell. That's all that means. To an instruction manual for making human beings. That's what it is. An instruction manual on how to make humans. And his analogy, letters correspond to nucleotides, which correspond to small clusters of nucleotides, which combine to form genes, which are like the chapters of our manual, which combine to form chromosomes, the volumes of our manual, which combine to form the whole genome, the entire library. And so what you'll see with mutations, to illustrate what a mutation would be, it's like when you leave off a letter on a word, or you misspell a word, or you duplicate a word, or you translocate a word to a different part of the book. That's a mutation. But notice in all those examples, nothing new has been added. There's not a new sentence, a new paragraph, a new chapter, a new book. And macroevolution requires new books, sequels of books to be written to make these changes. Yet it does not add any new information. It can't create anything. And that's the problem. A mutation doesn't produce major new raw material. You don't make a new species by mutating the species. That's a common idea people have, that evolution is due to random mutations. A mutation is not the cause of evolutionary change. And an evolutionist is the one who's saying that. So mutations can be either beneficial or detrimental. Genetic mutations are spontaneous chance changes which are rarely beneficial. The occurrence of beneficial mutations is rather rare. Not only does Darwinism not have answers for how information got into the genome, it doesn't ha even have answers for how it could stay there, how it could remain there, and that's the problem. And so they admit mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. Mutations are extremely random. There's no selection. They can't be controlled by natural selection. They're extremely rare. Some estimate anywhere between one to the 2,000th chance or one to the 1 billionth chance. That's how rare they are. And they are extremely bad. Some estimate 99.9% .9 of mutations are bad, are not productive, are not good, are lethal. And those that cause extensive changes that you need for evolution, modification, are the most harmful. And therefore, even the less likely to persist. So the Bible teaches, again, everything was created after its own kind. We see the Bible in complete harmony with what we see in the field of genetics. Whatever man sows, that he will also reap. Jesus himself said in Luke 6, 44, For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. And so this leads finally into the fossil record. If there is empirical evidence for evolution, it's got to be found in the rocks. And the record of the rocks. The evolutionary model would predict in the geologic column, which they'll say these different layers represent millions of years, which we don't believe, and we might talk about when we talk about the flood, but uh, the evolutionary theory would predict that in the lower levels, the oldest levels, you would find more simple organisms. And as you work your way up, they would get more and more complex. And in between, you'd find transitionary fossils from one kind to another, showing you know, the missing link, linking them from one kind to another. Creationists, though, would predict a model that would say that you would have a mixture of sim simple and complex organisms throughout the fossil record because they were created at the same time and that you would not find missing links. You would not find transitionary fossils from one kind to another because that doesn't happen. Darwin recognized the fossil record was a serious problem for his theory. I mean, he asked in his book, why then is not every geological formation, every stratum or layer full of intermediate links? Not only should you find a few, you should find a ton if the universe and the, the earth is so old and millions of years old, you should find tons of transitionary fossils. And he's saying, why haven't we found them? And you know what he said? He said, we'll find them eventually. That was his hope. And yet we haven't. We don't have a missing link. We have a missing chain. No real evolutionist, whether gradualistic or punctuationist, uses the fossil record as evidence in favor of the theory of evolution. <laughs> it's an understatement as opposed to special creation. The absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages between major transitions, precious little in the way of intermediate forms. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persist as the trade secret of paleontology. You know, if science has proven, as we're led to believe, if science has proven macro, not micro, macroevolution, then they should be able to show the proper arrangement of that process, the evolutionary tree leading to humans. Yet they haven't done that. To illustrate that, Richard Leakey, a famous fossil hunter in Africa, proposed a tree. His mother, Mary, proposed another one. And his wife, Meve, proposed a different one. They're not even in agreement within families. 
The evidence has not satisfied quite everybody. A few people who are not ignorant of the pertinent facts are nevertheless anti-evolutionist. Large number of well-trained scientists outside of evolutionary biology have unfortunately gotten the idea that the fossil record is far more Darwinian than it is. This probably comes from the oversimplification, inevitable and secondary sources, low-level textbooks, semi-popular articles, I blame the internet, and so on. Also, there's probably some wishful thinking involved. In the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions, these missing links. In general, these have not been found, yet the optimist has died hard and some pure fantasy has crept into the textbook. I'm tell you something really fascinating that also relates to the flood. Uh, the Cambrian explosion, the Cambrian is one of those layers, one of the oldest layers uh, in the rocks. Um, if I take the Cambrian explosion on its own, the logical conclusion I would draw is, wow, it was created. That's what atheists say. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to explain. It's incredible. The Cambrian explosion is basically an explosion of life forms that burst on the scene during the Cambrian layer all at once, without any evolutionary ancestry leading up to them. Just all of a sudden, all these plants and animals burst on the scene, and that's exactly what we would expect uh, under the creation uh, model. Richard Dawkins, writing about this Cambrian explosion, says, and we find many of them, speaking of these fossils, already in an advanced state, not simple, complex, an advanced state of evolution. The very first time they appear without any ancestors leading up to that complexity. It's as though they were just planted there. This is the same guy that talked about alien seeding, by the way, without any evolutionary history. Nevertheless, to say this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. The Cambrian explosion was the most remarkable and puzzling event in the history of life. Not puzzling to us. Christians would expect an explosion of fossils above a marker in time, a line in time after the flood. During the flood, there would have been a lot of uh, burials, a lot of preserved fossils because of that water and, and mud and, that preserved those fossils. And so we would expect to see evidence of that. And there's, in fact, what's known as the great unconformity, a line that stretches curiously around the whole planet, not just regionally or locally, it's global. Uh, and above that line, we have an explosion in the Cambrian strata. We have this explosion of fossils, exactly what we would expect if the Genesis account of creation and the flood was true. We have a complexity of life forms in the geologic column at the bottom. We think those layers were laid during the flood the same time very rapidly and I'll give evidence for that tomorrow Lord willing but according to the evolution the bottom layers are the oldest separated by millions of years and so in the bottom layer you should find very simple life forms and eventually transitioning to more complex life forms over time if the theory of evolution is true yet we find some amazing complexity at the very bottom without any ancestry leading into that complexity a trilobite is a great example of that an extinct marine anthropod that has no less than four complex optical principles in a system known as an optical doublet, perhaps making one of the most sophisticated visual systems in the biological world. This amazing animal supposedly died out millions of years before we supposedly evolved our complex eyes. How do you explain the trilobite existing before much more simple organisms? So where are the missing links? That's the question. Without the missing links, it would be like... Uh, uh, trying to prosecute someone for murder without a motive, without a confession, without weapons, without a body, without any witnesses. But yet we know they did it. Where's the missing links? They have the burden of proof to prove. Where's the, miss where's the evidence in the fossil record that proves the theory of evolution? The fossils that decorate our family tree are so scarce that there are still more scientists than specimens. And I want to illustrate that. There's, there's so few. And we want to give a few examples of some of the missing links that have been put forth and eventually exposed, Neanderthal, you've probably heard about Neanderthals, you know, cavemen, that's what they were described, the definitions, they're boorish, they're dim-witted, they're slow, you may hopefully haven't been called a Neanderthal, but the Neanderthal um, skull cap was discovered in the 1800s in a valley in Germany, and the person who discovered it examined it and said, this was a man with rickets and osteoporosis, another one, person uh, examined it and said it's an old man who suffered from arthritis. Finally, recent discoveries have shown Neanderthals alongside humans. They're not part of an evolutionary tree leading to humans. They coexisted. In fact, they found uh, human uh, remains, fossils, and caves in Israel that predate Neanderthals. The humans coming for Neanderthals. Neanderthals were not part of a evolution to humans. Detailed comparison of Neanderthal skeletal remains with those of modern humans have shown that there's nothing in Neanderthal anatomy that conclusively indicates locomotor 
manipulative, intellectual, or linguistic abilities inferior to those of modern humans. So Geico got it right. The caveman, the Neanderthal is all offended because he's not inferior to humans. It's so easy that a caveman can do it. Uh, the Neanderthals were simply humans. Nothing more, nothing less. And so that definition has been updated. The Neanderthal human subspecies, not in scientific use. What about Nebraska man? This is from a the front uh, cover of the London Illustrated News in 1922. They had found a tooth in Nebraska. They just This is what they find. They find a tooth, and now we have a missing link. It's how paltry the, the data, the evidence, the fossil record is. And from this one tooth, the, the artist took some creative liberties. I wasn't going to show you all the creative liberties, a little immodest. Creative liberties of this man and this woman from this tooth. And this alleged missing link was known as Nebraska Man. Y'all ready to see what Nebraska Man is? It was a wild pig's tooth. After further research, they realized it was a wild pig's tooth. The 14th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica sheepishly admitted that a mistake had been made and that the tooth belonged to a being of another order. I love the quote from creationist Dwayne Gish. This is a case in which a scientist made a man out of a pig and the pig made a monkey out of the scientist. <laughs> Piltdown, Maine, which was in uh, England, and again, in the early 1900s, they found an ape's jaw with a canine tooth worn down, kind of like a human's. And that's another missing link was put forward, one that possessed the skull of a human and the jawbone of an ape. Some of the most brilliant evolutionists in England were taken by this, were fooled into thinking this was a missing link. But 1953, and this is sadly how this narrative works. Discovery's made, front page. Forty years later, it's exposed on page 7B. Piltdown Man was exposed as a forgery and fake. The skull was modern. The teeth on the ape's jaw had been filed and treated biochemically to make them appear old. You want to know what Piltdown Man is? They took a human skull, a monkey's jawbone, and a dog's tooth and glued it together. This isn't science, it's art. Anthropologists refer to the hoax as another instance of desire for fame, leading a scholar to dishonesty. So they're trying to explain it. You know, you want money from a museum. You, you're kind of bored with what you're doing. You've got to kind of make something up. So this dishonesty, they're kind of trying to explain why these kind of things seem to happen. And then they boast that the unmasking of the deception is a tribute to the persistence and skill of modern research. They've exposed it. Persistence and skill indeed. When they have taken over 40 years to discover the difference between an ancient fossil and a modern chimpanzee, a chimpanzee could have done it quicker. What about Orse Man? This was discovered in the 1980s in Ors, near Orse, Spain. After discovering it, they, they, had a, they called for a three-day symposium for participants to come from all over to discuss and analyze this fossil dubbed Orse Man. You want to know what Orse Man is? Spanish experts revealed it was likely a skull fragment from a four-month-old donkey. The embarrassed Spanish authorities had to quickly send out cancellations uh, to that symposium. Rhodesian man found in the 1920s in southern Africa. They found a man, a woman, and, and one or two children. Only the skull of the man was preserved. It's interesting. It was taken to a museum, ran by a man who was part of the Piltdown Man episode, and he put a bird specialist in charge of reconstructing restructuring this human fossil. Why a bird specialist was put in charge of reconstructing human remains, nobody is sure. Nobody has figured out. And he did so in a way that the, the feet were in, the knees were bowed out, and gave him a ridiculous posture. And it wasn't until scientists trained in human anatomy looked at it, they said, you know what, this is a human. Nothing more, nothing less. Java man, they found a fossilized tooth in the late 1800s, a little later, they found uh, some other things like a tooth and a thigh bone that they believed was an upright uh, creature. When the man initially found the skull, the man who found that skull initially thought that it belonged to some type of monkey. You ever heard the expression, uh, go with your gut, go with your instinct? That would have applied here. They put them all together and said, here's a missing link. And after further research, they realized and discovered that the thigh bone and the tooth were in fact human, and the skull was a giant gibbon, a monkey. Finally, Ida, a more recent one. This was when I was in engineering school at Oklahoma State around 2008 or 2009. The 
the world by storm. The scientific community was showing him that this is your great, great, great grandmother, proving again that you're evolved. Uh, Google, the world's most powerful search engine, had an image of Eda uh, on it. One scientist referred to it as the eighth wonder of the world because it will finally confirm irrefutably Sir Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Y'all ready to see what Eda is? Eda is a lemur. Her mother was a lemur. Her grandmother was a lemur. Her great-grandmother was a lemur. And you're not evolved from lemurs any more than you're evolved from ladybugs. She's not even America's favorite lemur. That crown and title is worn already by somebody else. What the record shows is nearly a century of fudging and finagling by scientists attempting to force various fossil morsels and fragments to confirm Darwin's notions, all to no avail. Today, the millions of fossils stand as visible, ever-present reminders of the paltriness of the arguments and the overall shabbiness of the theory that marches under the banner of evolution. It must be significant that nearly all the evolutionary stories I learned as a student have now been debunked. Science is not as empirical as many scientists seem to think it is. Unobserved and even unobservable entities play an important part in it. Science is not just the making of observations. It's the making of inferences on the basis of observations within the framework of a theory. And so as we close, I just want to read from Romans 1. I can't help but think of this text, <laughs> when we, especially when we go through the missing links. I just cannot help but think of them and warn us to not make the same mistake. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. You don't need to be shamed into silence for your faith. Apologize for your faith. Now you need to do that with meekness and in fear. But you don't need to be intellectually intimidated that you're ignorant or stupid or insane or wicked because you believe in God's existence, special creation, the Genesis account, the inspiration of the Bible, and the deity of Jesus Christ. You're not unscientific and irrational and unreasonable for believing that. Romans 1 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. It's the agenda. They suppress the truth. Why? In unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, as invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they become fools. And change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature, the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The admonition is we offer an invitation. Don't make that mistake. Don't make that mistake. If you're here and you're subject to the invitation, only God can create something, can create something entirely new. He can make you a new creation. Through the blood of Christ, he can resurrect you to walk, transformed into newness of life, something entirely different than you were before. Maybe you're here and as a Christian, you need, you're, you're dealing with spiritual entropy and digression. The only one who can reverse spiritual entropy, that process, <laughs> is God in Christ. And so if you need to respond to that invitation, the Lord invites you to come as we stand and sing.